<laughs> Our author of the hour was four years old when an elephant chased her down a forest road and she decided to write her first story about it. Uh, 17 years later and many, many manuscripts later, she signed her first book deal. She's the author of Lost Girl, A Spark of White Fire, and its sequels, uh, Kiki Kalira Breaks a Kingdom, and now her first novel for adults, uh, The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches. Sungu Mandata, uh, thank you so much for being here today. Hi, thanks for having me. You're joining us all the way from England, and yeah. as I understand, it's traditional to ask, how is the weather there? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it could be better. Uh, yeah. I feel like it's, so we had a really, really terrible summer. Mm -hmm. um, like it's been so hot, and because all the buildings are designed to keep heat in, it's just been miserable. And I feel like we're finally starting to cool down but not fast enough, in my opinion. Like, yes. I feel like the moment September hits, we need autumn. It's just rude not to. Absolutely. We got like a false autumn day on uh, the very beginning. Yes. Of her, and then it went away again in the summer. It's been much the same. We just have like a day of rain and a day of like, oh, it's nice and romantic. There's rain. Mm -hmm. And then no. It just stops. <laughs> I know. Well, we will get there eventually, hopefully. But <laughs> and I'm in Wisconsin, where it is very snowy, and I'm I'm ready for it. <laughs> All the fall. Um, right, so let's get to the book. Um, the first thing I want to ask is, uh, since this is your first book for adults, how much of a relief was it to use curse words? <laughs> <laughs> It was, it was. Um, so, I mean, I don't know what this says about me, but I am just naturally in my everyday speech, very, very sweary. Um, and so, I mean, I've been writing children's books long enough that, it, that I don't, or, that I don't, you know, really include them. Um, like my writing doesn't <laughs> lend itself to that. But when I was working on this, it felt a lot more like my present day voice. So yes, there was a certain amount of glee. Yes. <laughs> and just throwing in all the swear words. Is this your first novel that's mostly set in like what we would deem the human world? Because uh, I haven't read your other words. Yes, I think, I mean, um, my very first book, The Lost Girl, was set in, in our world but like witches had like paranormal and sci-fi elements. Yeah. Um, whereas this one is again set in our world, it's contemporary, but it has magical elements. Uh, so I think, I think, yeah, I'd probably say this is the one that's been the most um, grounded. Yeah, because it really, I mean, because it's partially set uh, exactly where you are in the world. Yeah. Um, and then you can really feel that too. It, it feels like a, a grounded, you know, the magic is there, but it's, it's not the, um, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but it's, uh, I don't know, I really felt the Englandness of it all. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I'm, I mean, I'm really glad that you did, because that is one of the things I wanted to do when I chose to set the book here where I live was effectively to write um, like a love letter to Norfolk, to the places I see every day and the place I've lived for 12 years now. So it's, um, yeah, so it's nice that that's, that's come through. And I do think that in general, um, there is something very whimsical and romantic about the English countryside. <laughs> oh, absolutely, the, the, the nature. Yeah. I, I visited exactly once for 10 days and it was just so green. Yes, it is. It is. I think that, that always surprises people. It surprised me when I first moved here. I mean, I grew up in the tropics. Like I grew up in India. You'd think I'd be used to green, but it's a different kind of green. It's a sort oh, of spring green, like, yes. like almost like eternal spring. Because mm -hmm. it's, I mean, I, I imagine it's partially because of all that rain. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't and it's like, evaporate as much because it's not very hot. And until recently, yeah, the temperature didn't really change that much over the course of the year, but over the last not, not 10 years or so, I guess, like everywhere else in the world, the temperatures are more extreme. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. I 
I love the, the nature in this book too, because at, at points in the story, they're stopping on the side of the road just because Mika's like, I, I gotta get some like herbs and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> Is that something that like, when you were writing this book, is that something that you could do yourself as like a way to, or or was it just sort of something you imagined that the character would do? It's something, I mean, I wouldn't say that I've necessarily stopped to gather herbs or plants, but saying that, I have been known to kind of stop in the most awkward places to like take a video or a photograph of something pretty. <laughs> So, I mean, literally last year, I almost got myself run over because I was so, like, determined to get a photo of this field of sunflowers, mm -hmm. which happened to be right next to a very busy road. And there was me just kind of, like, casually crossing over to try and get. Um, so, yes, it is the kind of thing I would do. Maybe not necessarily yeah. the way Mika does it. And she is a lot more sensible about it. But for me, it's kind of to try and capture um, something I see that makes me feel a certain way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, no, I totally. I've gotten in trouble for stopping to take pictures of things before. <laughs> so, um, well, I so what I wanted to know first off is what was the initial spark that inspired this book? Um, was it? Did it start with witches? Did it start with found family? Like, uh, what was the? It's, it's really. It's not that I don't remember. It's more that it's really hard to kind of pinpoint which came first. Yes. So I would say probably um, the witch part. Mm -hmm. Like I think I knew that I wanted to tell a story about witches. And then I think from there, uh, the moment I had Mika and I knew who she was, I started to ask questions like, why is she the way she is? What sort of rules does she have to live by to make her feel this way? And what can change? And I knew from the start that she was going to find a family that she'd never had before. I knew that she was going to fall in love. I knew that she was going to embrace her magical self and it was just kind of I guess unraveling the way that would all pan out um yeah so I mean I probably probably the witch came first it's a bit chicken and egg it's hard to know <laughs> fair enough totally fair enough so you um in that same vein was the loneliness because loneliness is such a huge theme in the book yeah. that was from the beginning then I think so. I mean, I think I, I often say that the reason I started writing this book at that particular time was because it was the end of 2020. And I think that was a year when we were all struggling with loneliness and isolation in so many ways. And so it seemed inevitable that that would be a huge part of the story. Um, and that I would lean into the idea of how much we need human connection in a way that I don't think I'd really appreciated before. I think when you have it and you just take it for granted, you don't realize how much we need those connections until you're you know, living in lockdown for months on end. And so, yeah, I think the loneliness was always going to be a part of it. Then, of course, there's also the fact that Mika's loneliness comes from an element of um, marginalization. She lives on the edges of society. She doesn't feel like she belongs or fits in anywhere. And that can be very lonely. That can be extremely isolating, even if you know that there might be others like you out there. If you can't build relationships with them if you can't find somewhere you belong then it's just a bit empty isn't it um and yeah so I think that I kind of drew on my own experiences of kind of feeling like I didn't belong or I didn't quite fit in and so yeah I, mean, I think it was inevitable that that would all come into play in some way yeah because it's in it, what I found remarkable about the book is how thoroughly you 
um, bake in that element of loneliness into um, the fact that not only is she a witch, but she's also been raised in very extreme circumstances, uh, mm -hmm. Primrose, and she's also, um, she's not white, you know, and that's uh, an element that is recurring throughout the story that not only is she um, Indian, but also you know, these girls are mm -hmm. varying, you know, from all over the globe. Um, and there's more too, but I, um, I just love how how everything feeds into that same theme. Um, it's a very uh, cohesive book in that regard. So I guess it's just my compliment to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Um, I mean, I am really glad that that is making itself felt mm -hmm. to readers because that was important to me to show that sense of how different identities can manifest isolation and loneliness in different ways. Um, yeah it's um thank you <laughs> yeah because i well i did um something of a deep dive uh in that i googled it and read one article um <laughs> this article that was uh really interesting it's on the nerdist i think and i was talking about um pop culture witches and how so many of the good witches at least um in tv and film are white um so mm -hmm. few uh, good witches out there are uh, any person of color and you know trying to think of a witch of color in visual media I thought of uh, Bonnie from the Vampire Diaries like okay she's cool and then um, I forget the character name but the um, actress Rachel True in The Craft um, mm. and not really very nice throughout that <laughs> that movie no um, it, it has been, um, yeah, no, I mean, it has been a very predominantly white subgenre of fantasy. I mean, I think a lot of fantasy has until recently been very white. Yes. Um, I mean, it's been very exciting, I think, to see so many witch books coming out recently that have had more witches of color. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I do love, like, I don't think that we... Um, that characters of color should be limited to just being either evil or good. I mean, I think we should be allowed to have the full spectrum of um, of morality, I suppose. Uh, but it is it is nice to finally see that there is some of that range. Yes, absolutely. And and I do think to your point that um, you it seems like and i'm no expert but it seems like we see diversity in books before we see them on in film and television um so i'm hoping it's a sign of, of things to come because there are a lot mm. um my coworker ollie uh gave me a list of books and of course i have i don't have on me now but um of books with uh witches in particular who were not white uh who have various backgrounds and whatnot so um hoping as things go, you know, adaptations might happen and then we might see more um, witches of all sorts on screen as well as just- Yeah. You know, I, it, that would be lovely, wouldn't it? That would just be um, amazing to see. And I think in general, like witches of all, or just fantasy characters of all um, kinds of identities. Like there are so many of us who have yet to find a character that we can really see ourselves in on like growing up i i remember vividly that i loved the x-men loved them but i remember that storm was the one who came closest um and you know at the end of the day we don't have the same identity storm and me <laughs> but she came closest and i remember that that's the kind of thing we had to settle for when uh, we were kids were finding something that was close enough yes and I think now that there are so many people with disabilities so many queer people so many people of color who deserve to see themselves in all kinds of fiction not necessarily fiction that's just about that particular issue but also just having fun in a fantasy world exactly yeah absolutely I mean like my husband and I are watching the Sandman adaptation right now and I'm so excited about Kirby Howell Baptiste 
playing death because sure she doesn't look like anything uh like the original comics but also who cares she is the personification of death she is just incredible like i love that adaptation so much um i think we i think my husband and i watched it in about two nights like the whole thing um and yes the episode with um with death is just you 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 can watch it and see <laughs> oh yeah yeah it's the literally the next one we're watching and i'm hoping to watch it tonight but yeah i mean because i thought it was such perfect casting because she has such a sunny disposition yes for that particular version of death so like i guess i love you know casting for the person the character the um, personality and not mm -hmm. really how they're supposed to look yes so, and it's great uh so you you mentioned a bit about you know like talking about marginalized uh communities of, of all sort um i was reading rereading the book recently and the the girls were asking about are there any boy witches and um it's not really because it's such a limited um view that nika has because it's been imposed that limit mm -hmm. imposed on her. She doesn't really know the answer to that question. But yeah, room for, uh, let's say, like a, a trans man, uh, you know, that sort of thing to also be incorporated into the story. If I think so, because you know, I've thought about this, and um, the way I see magic manifesting itself is that it is something that happens to witches before they're born but it's not something that is biological like it does not have to link to um the the gender they're assigned at birth so i mean i think it would be entirely po possible for a trans woman to be a witch um in this world it is typically women mika doesn't know if there are boy witches um there could be i think there's scope for that I wanted to focus on the the feminine, and that could be both cis and trans, uh, because I think that that is typically and historically it's the the women who have been. Um, <laughs> I, I write. I swear. I know words. <laughs> <laughs> the women who have been. Oh God, what's the word I'm looking for? Persecuted yes. for being a little bit strange. Um, and yes, men have also historically been accused of witchcraft and punished, but it has predominantly been women. And so that was what I wanted to focus on. Um, but that is not to say that it can only be one kind of um, feminine. Right, yeah, because it really does feel kind of like Nika definitely just would not know the answer to that question. Yes, so... she, I mean, she wouldn't. I, I don't think many people would because that is part of the problem is that witches have isolated themselves so much for various spoilery reasons that there is no um that there is no link to like a wider um context they don't know what else or who else might be out there anymore it's such a good um story structure too because it, i don't think i've ever seen a which story not that i'm an expert in it but i don't ever think i've ever seen a witch story where um it hasn't been like a generational hereditary or passed down through lineage sort mm -hmm. of thing, or even like a, a formal school <laughs> setting yeah. where you know these people can go and learn it's literally the exact opposite it's put them away mm -hmm. ever they can never hang out except for a very you know small increments of time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, was that a, uh, it seems like that was a fertile uh, ground for, for writing this story too, because from that follows everything else, as I said before. But um, I just, yeah, I, it's, I really love that about the uh, story that she, um, the way you baked that in. And I liked the idea of it not being a lineage. Like, I mean, I love stories with like these long histories and with these, you know, old families. But in this particular, I think the heart of the story is that 
no matter who you are, witch or not a witch, or, you know, whatever the color of your skin, whatever your sexuality, whatever your abilities, you are welcomed in this place. And so I think part of that, like, it was important to me that there be little to no sort of biological family um, and history, that it be people who are in some ways adrift, who don't have history, who find that they have, that, they, that in spite of that, they can find family, that family and love don't have to be linked to, and power don't have to be linked to like, centuries of lineage absolutely um and so that leads me to i think there's so many favorite parts of this book for me but i love the three girls um, <laughs> got rosetta who's 10 she's shy um she's super sweet and then you've got terracotta who is kind of a mini psychopath and i love her <laughs> She's not, she, is, yeah. she, she presents herself as such at the beginning. And then um, Altamira, who I'd say is uh, sort of like the um, pretty stereotypical young child doesn't, yes. like she's uh, so enthusiastic. <laughs> she doesn't know what to do with herself. <laughs> um, so were they, I don't wanna ask if they're like based on anything in particular, but uh, how did you form these characters? With the children, I think it was tricky because on the one hand, I wanted to write them just as they kind of presented themselves to me, kind of authentic and organic and just let them do what they wanted. But you do also, I mean, it's not a book about children. It is a book about the adults in their lives. So it was kind of trying to find a balancing act between um, letting the children do their thing, but also sort of, reining it in so that the focus especially coming as somebody who had been writing children's fiction I could see that it would be very easy to kind of give the children bigger and bigger roles mm -hmm. um but you know I did always kind of see them in my head as they would be the oldest would be kind of like the big sister responsible shy um sweet very bookish a lot like like I think I was quite a quite like that as a child and then the youngest would you know be the child very much just happy to be a child regardless of the magic she has at her fingertips and terracotta was just fun she was just fun to to like come up with she is a little mini psychopath i love her yeah honestly an icon uh probably my favorite character in the book as far as like just <laughs> the one whenever she came up i always enjoyed every single thing she said yeah. um, I'm not, <laughs> she I was she, so much fun i think altamira was the one though that had my favorite quote which is um now that's some mary poppins shit right there <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah i but, mean i think that like regardless of who you are there is something unbelievably funny about a child just like swearing right just yes. like I, I don't I'm not, i don't know what it is but like, like you can see thousands of tiktoks which have like hundreds of thousands of likes because everybody like cracks up when a child just comes out of nowhere with that kind of stuff and Absolutely. i mean my children have done it so mm -hmm. it was it, it, yeah it was a thing yeah I, I i was a teacher for a brief period and i never ever could punish a child for swearing because i was just laughing <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and you know everyone says that it's the worst thing you could do like to laugh when a child does it because immediately they think yes i'm gonna do this again but how can you not <laughs> yeah i don't know as long as i'm not trying to harm anyone or insult anyone i i just whatever it's just a word. yeah exactly um but the the beautiful thing i think about these three girls is that they in triplicate reflect directly back on tamika um mm -hmm. see in multiple points in the story especially jamie who we need to talk about of course but um, <laughs> jamie uh is one of those characters who sees mika not only as herself but he also continually looks back on her childhood for her and it's like you know that's really messed up um because of his experience raising these girls mm -hmm. um so I, th I think it works perfectly in the story because again it all reflects back onto um nika 
we got to talk. I think about she. <laughs> she... <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, just to kind of yeah, um, they they do reflect back on her. In fact, the reason that she breaks all the rules to give them um, the magical tutoring that she's been kind of pleaded with to, to, to give them. She, and you know, she's not supposed to, but she does it because she wants them to have what she didn't have. She wants them to grow up differently. She wants them to be able to have the things. Um, and in some ways they do, they do already have things she didn't have and she sees that. Um, and they are, I think, um, a vision of possibility to her. Oh, absolutely. And I, I, I don't know, I just, I, I love the implications of this so much too, because, you know, she's uh, living in a world where you can't, or not can't, but um, it would be unwise to maybe have a child, mm -hmm. but she gets to see what it's like to, um, to, be involved in um, a witch's childhood, which is so yeah, cool. yeah. Um, she gets yeah, she does get to really just treat them how she wished she was treated. Just so lovely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Jamie, I get <laughs> Jamie is the best. <laughs> I love I love him so much because um, he's so grumpy. He is, yeah. The grumpy Sunny thing is one of my best, my favorite tropes oh and, yeah one of mine too yeah he's and you know as it always is with the grumpy characters it's, it's just like uh pessimists you know they're just optimists who have been hurt so badly that they go on to the other side um because of course he's a cinnamon roll uh yes yes of course he is just um yeah he is very much that um kind of embodies that idea of somebody who is all bark and no bite mm -hmm. um like he is a grump he is just so grumpy um i think mika calls him like an old man at some point and that is exactly he is just like a grumpy old man but underneath all of that is just so much love for the family that he has fought really hard to have mm -hmm. and um yeah and i think that the nice thing about mika and jamie together apart from the grumpy sunshine like mm -hmm. interactions is the fact that they have both been hurt in the past they both know what it is to be traumatized and to grieve things that have been lost but he is kind of further along in um like i mean i wouldn't say therapy but like if you imagine healing as a kind of a line when he's further along in that journey and so he's able to kind of see things um and recognize things in her that she's not yet able to see yeah, absolutely, because he's been living at Nowhere House for what, 20 years. He's hey. had time to move move on a bit and get, you know, have that feeling of family and whatnot. Yeah. It's only just now getting. Um, I Yeah, and then that brings us to Nowhere House, which is, by the way, I know I'm a huge nerd, but I know that it's an amazing house when I want to build it in The Sims. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> But, uh, it's it's a beautiful house, lots of gardens and whatnot, mm -hmm. and we have these uh, three. Well, I mean, aside from Jamie, three wonderful people who um, live and work there. We've got Ian and his husband Ken, and then we've got Lucy, and they're like our core cast as far as the lovely people who take these take all these um, you know misfits in. Um, how did they come about? I mean, did they kind of come naturally with the story? I, yeah, I mean, I think that Ian just kind of writes himself. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't have kept him out of the story if I tried. Um, but he is very much the, the person who, who makes things happen. Um, not necessarily in a good way, <laughs> but it always comes from a place of love. He's just mischief personified. He is determined that everybody around him needs to be as happy as he is. Um, and, you know, because he and Ken have been together so long and they've been so happy together, he wants that for everybody else. And he will go about that 
<laughs> in ways that are not necessarily um, <laughs> sensible and that drive Jamie absolutely insane. But he does mm -hmm. it anyway because he just loves them all so much. And Ken and Lucy, um, I mean, I can't. I, <laughs> one of the things about writing a book is that you end up writing so many drafts that you sometimes forget what actually made it into the final mm -hmm. book. But I think this is in the final book, which is effectively somebody um, acknowledging that Ken and Lucy are the only sane people in that whole family. And yes. it's true. They are. They really are. How they put up with everybody else, I do not know. But they do. I think sane people are drawn to insane people because they're like, I just, yes. I never know what they're going to do. And that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's my yeah, hope. So they are the they are the sort of solid ground, I suppose. While Ian is up in the air, Ken is very firmly has his feet planted on the ground. Um, and yeah, and you know, I think the setting of the house just kind of um, brings them all together. It gives them all a role. It gives them all a place to be safe and welcomed and to find a home. Um, I saw somebody, and you know, obviously because you know this is me I can't actually remember who it was right now but I saw someone on social media who mentioned that they weren't sure whether it was nowhere house or now here house and I just thought that that was I mean I intended it as nowhere I'm not going to take credit for being like clever but <laughs> I just thought that was incredible because in so many ways that's kind of how it is yes it's a house in the middle of nowhere Yes, it's where people who have come from nowhere find a place, but also now here. They are now here and here being like the pinnacle of, yeah, I just, I, I don't know. I just love that. That's wonderful. No, I love it when people uh, come up with these things because it's like, A, thank you. And B, it, it really shows that you have set, I mean, if, even if you didn't intend it, you set it up <laughs> to where people are really thinking about this hard. Yes. You know. Yeah. And I do. And I love that. I do. Like one of the things I've always loved about writing books is that there is so much that a reader can take from it that maybe you intended, maybe you didn't intend it, but there's just so much room to take things from a story. Absolutely. Um, one of the things I noticed when I was um, rereading the book is um, I think the, the pacing is really good too because um, I don't want to I don't want to spoil it too much so I won't say much about it but uh, the the progression of Mika and Jamie throughout the story uh, I was very happy rereading it that when they did get together um, fully <laughs> it was. <laughs> It was after all cards were on the table, so to speak. Yes, so, um, that's very important. So I and I it is. It was really important to me as well. Like while I, I mean, I don't get me wrong. I love the 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 someone has a secret that they're keeping from somebody else trope. I do, but in this particular story, where so much of the heart of the story is about trust and love, and being fully included I knew that they they couldn't it wouldn't be fair for them to get together until they both had told each other everything that needed to be told absolutely yeah uh, I the book has been out for a while but I would never want to spoil uh this particular one for the um the audience because I um without saying anything about it I, <laughs> The ending definitely took me by surprise the first time because I don't know. I guess I just read so many romance novels. Um, mm -hmm. I would say this is like a only romance novels, far from it. But um, I read so many of them that I wasn't quite expecting it to go that deep into other things. Um, did you do you think of this as a romance novel? Do you think of it as a fantasy? Uh, I call it a romantic fantasy because although, and this is not a spoiler, um, there is a happily ever after. And I think that's key to romance because also, although it has that, 
I like I'm a huge romance reader. And so I know that romance readers have very reasonable expectations for what they need to get from a book. And I know that because the romance between Mika and Jamie, though important, is a subplot and in the way secondary to the greater like plot of family. Um, I, I, I don't call it a romance because of that, because the, the main story is about um, family and not about romance. So I call it a romantic fantasy. Um, I don't know if that's the correct genre, but. <laughs> I think it's becoming such a genre now because I'm, I'm thinking of, there are multiple titles I can think of that I read this year alone that I would call a romantic fantasy. Like you can't really separate the two yes. necessarily. Um, one informs the other. And then for some, some readers who love fantasy only, I would be like, oh, there's way too much romance in this for me. And then romance readers, I think, would generally just love it anyway, because I yeah. <laughs> any subplot of a romance I'm given. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm like, I, I'm much like that. I'm I'm there if there's romance, uh, regardless of how um, how prominent it is. It is a big um, it is a big draw for me as a um, as a reader as well. But I do think that yes, there has been a lot recently. It's huge, and I mean, I love that because I mean, growing up and now, my two favorite genres are fantasy and romance. So combine them and I'm just like in seventh heaven. <laughs> and you know, that was, but I'm thinking about the range because like I recently read The Undertaking of Heart and Mercy by yeah. Megan Bannon. Mm -hmm. And oh, if you've got it, yes, yes, wave it. Yeah, the gallery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's my it book is, club book for November. Have you read it yet? No, 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 I've, I'm saving okay. it till the beginning of November, I think. Well, I won't spoil anything but I would call that one more of a fantasy romance because I think the romance is a lot more prominent um whereas I would call the very secret society of irregular witches a romantic fantasy um it's weird <laughs> I don't know <laughs> yeah no, it's a I weird kind of, but I do love that there is so much range in the in the marriage of fantasy and romance <laughs> Oh yeah, absolutely. Because it really, um, I don't know, it just broadens the scope of what a romance can do as far as I'm concerned. I'm, and maybe it's just because I'm reading so many um, just what I would call regular old uh, contemporary rom-coms right now. Mm -hmm. I just, that's why I've been trying to reach out and find sci-fi romances and fantasy mm -hmm. romances just because it, it, it helps deepen the genre to the point where you're not limited to you know five different beats in a story and then yeah ever after you know I also wonder how much um of it now is is a kind of um resurrection of paranormal romance mm -hmm. because oh, I mean gosh. that was huge for a very long time I loved it I mean, Nalini Singh has been writing paranormal romance for like, what, 20 years now. Um, I mean, I don't know, maybe that's, maybe I'm aging her more than I should be, um, but a really long time. But I do know that for a while there, you just like, it wasn't a thing. People were like, oh no, the market's saturated. But I think it might finally be coming back. I think you're right. Yeah, it's like an ebb and a flow. And I think we've gotten a, a nice big influx more mm. recently so it feels like it's suddenly here um yeah but yeah I mean paranormal romance has been around forever and um I can think of multiple ones that people are so obsessed over that have <laughs> books now and stuff like that um which you know that's just exciting because I need to get to go back and read all of those too yes um you you said you're a big fan of romance and mm -hmm. um I just remembered I actually wrote down the page number because I was so happy to read this but you said that um on page 234 Mika's talking and she says that Northanger Abbey uh or could be second best uh Jane Austen book is that your opinion too uh 
No, actually. Um, okay. I feel like it's the kind of thing Mika would put as her second best because okay. Mika is the kind of person who likes big, um, dramatic, gothic imaginings um, that don't necessarily pan out. <laughs> so she's that sort of very imaginative and dramatic kind of person. So I think she would. I do enjoy it. But no, I think my, I mean, my Emma is still my absolute favorite. I think Persuasion is probably my second. Um, and then Pride and Prejudice third. After that, I think they're all kind of right. anywhere. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm the first to admit that I am not hugely into the classics. Um, they are very homogenous, <laughs> um, but I do love Jane Austen. Yeah, I, um, I, part of my uh, school experience was was taking all of those survey of British literature, survey of American literature, et cetera, et cetera. And, and luckily I was able to have professors who were um, shaking up the canon a little bit. So we would mm -hmm. read a classic dead white guy, you know, and then we would veer off and do, um, you've never heard of this person, but they're also, you know, uh, they were writing around the same time, and they also yeah. did wonderful work. Um, so yeah, I, like Jane Austen, though you can't. It's like the prototype for the, it is. the romance. Yeah, yeah, it is. And you know, I mean, I and I think they still hold up really well. Um, they're still so funny and so entertaining, and yeah, I just I do love Jane Austen. Absolutely. Uh, I got excited when I saw Northanger Abbey though, because that is my um, book club pick for <laughs> December, um, simply because I wanted to reread it. And um, it's the book club meeting is supposed to be December 25th. I don't think I'm going to have a lot of attendees that day. So I figured <laughs> go ahead and read it. Um, but I really love that book because I think it's so, it's her funniest book for sure. Um, mm. like and it is just so relatable as well like I mean I could see myself doing that like just fully leaning into oh my god I'm misinterpreting everything and having these sinister motives yes <laughs> absolutely nothing is going on it's all yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. it's so funny to me I, I listened to a couple of podcasts that you were on before uh doing this interview and um yeah, I love that, uh, like on Books and Boba, you guys talked uh, pretty in depth about the, the diversity in the book, which um, again is one of my favorite things uh, about it, that you make it a book about um, exploring people on the margins in multiple ways and whatnot. Um, is there, I, you, you said a, a, there could be a chance of another book in this world, but um... I would love to revisit um, this world and these characters. Like, I mean, I love them. I think that they're, I mean, I, you know, they're probably stories that could still be told. Um, I don't have any plans right now. And I yeah. something that I would, I would love to do, but I would want to wait until I had the right story. Um, but I am, like my next book, which will be out around this time next year, is not set in the same, it's not Mika's universe. It's still contemporary. It's still a romantic fantasy. But I think it has the same kind of like cozy vibes, um, exploring what it is to be on the margins. So I think if you like this one, you'll probably like that one, but they are not connected. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. That is good to know because sometimes people, um, like uh, Everina Maxwell's book, is set in the same universe, but it's entirely on a diff in a different galaxy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's just so many different ways to do it. Like yeah. with with subsequent books, they could be a sequel, they could be a companion, or they could be something completely new. And I think it is important to clarify that so that people know what to expect. Absolutely. Uh, Jennifer in the Q and A wanted to know um, what your writing routine is like daily, and I would like to tap on to that as well. Did it? Did your writing process change at all writing this book as opposed to the previous ones? The process didn't change. Um, I think for whatever reason, I have much the same process with all of my books, which is 
really just an emotional roller coaster of going from I love this idea to oh maybe this isn't working to this is the worst thing that has ever been written by anybody and finally to oh maybe this is okay after all <laughs> um and that kind of that, that is my process is to kind yes. of work my way through those emotions to get to the end and I think that's the same regardless of the age group I'm writing for but in terms of a daily routine you know I used to be one of those people who was so excited to write that I would sit down any spare minute I had but I don't know if like I mean I'm 34 I'm not that old <laughs> but I feel like I don't have the stamina I had when I was in my early 20s. I get tired very easily. I have children. So now my writing routine is more of a, when there's time, I need to kind of assess, have I got the energy and the headspace? Yeah. So if I have all three, then I will sit down and write. And it's not necessarily the most disciplined way, but I mean, I have ADHD and it's the only way I know how to work is to kind of make all three things like headspace, time and energy, like come together. It's own little magic. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I'm also 34 and um, I, you just reminded me one of my other favorite things about this book is that the, the romance in this is between people in their thirties, um, which is, you know, I, like I read a lot of romance and a lot of it seems to be uh, people in their in their 20s um, and uh, I don't know it's just really nice to see I don't know people in their 30s of course I'd love to see older people as well yes no I mean I think it is something that is I mean I met my husband when I was 20 so I mean I was a young um, I was young when I found love and um, but it isn't realistic to assume that everyone will. Yes. And given, and because I wrote this book at a time when I needed it most, you know, we were in the pandemic and um, I just wanted escapism, just some, somewhere to be that wasn't the real world. Um, I also think that I sort of naturally gravitated to a character who was closer to my age and sort of in the same kind of headspace I'm in. Yeah, and I think it um, it really comes through too that you know this is a this is a person who, despite the fact that she uh, grew up in very lonely circumstances and whatnot, she's a person who does know her own uh, brain. She's been through her own set of trauma and circumstances and whatnot. Mm -hmm. It's all formed her character, and she feels like a real human being, you know. Yeah, and that she's been through things and. Um, and I think one of the things about being in your 30s, um, and for Mika as well, is that in spite of the fact that she does not have everything she dreams of, she has matured enough that she embraces herself. And I mean, I think that was relatable to me because I think I'm only just getting to that point where I am accepting myself and embracing myself as, you know, in, in all of the flaws and glories or whatever. Um, and I think my 20s was very much a time of not doing that. Um, and I don't know if it's just growing older or if it's just something that happens, but yeah, I feel like there does come a point where you hopefully accept yourself. And I don't think it's, it has to be one particular point. It can be multiple points. Yes. For life too, which is wonderful to see. I mean, it is a journey. Yeah, it doesn't really stop. I don't think anybody Absolutely. ever gets to the point where they're completely content with everything about themselves. But that's part of being human, isn't it? That you always feel like there are ways to grow. Oh, no, I don't ever want to feel like, oh, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I'm baked. I'm finished. Yeah. <laughs> Take me out of the oven and let me cool. And then... This is the best it's ever going to be. <laughs> <laughs> that would be horrible. So, exactly. Because that is what kind of what's implied when you say, okay, I'm done, is that from here on out, you're just going to go stale. <laughs> like, no. Yeah, yeah, just, just plateau. We're good. No more growth. Uh, yeah, definitely not realistic. That's for sure. Um, well, I am so 
uh, happy that I got to talk to you today. Uh, like I said, I read this book so many months ago and I reread it recently. Um, it, it came to me at a time, you know, you're talking about writing it during the pandemic at a time you really needed it, but it came to me, you know, around the same time, so to speak, where all I'm looking for is things that will make me happy mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, make me feel things. And um, this is definitely the book for that. Every time anyone comes in and asks for a book that is um, just wonderful, this is the book I put in their hands. Oh, uh, so much. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it, it makes me so happy to know because that is what I wanted that people would find the same things in the book that I found writing it. Um, so yeah, that makes me very happy. Well, I'm very glad because, uh, yeah, I uh, couldn't be more thrilled that this uh, book is out now and um, that I actually get to put it in people's hands because it's been a long time of me just saying. It is hard when you read things early, isn't it? Yeah, 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 months and months in advance. Um, so yeah, I think uh, we did it. We did the thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, thank you again so much because this is also, you know, you're a, an ocean away and we were able to make this happen. Um, oh, I mean, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Little tiny bookstore in uh, Wisconsin and Milwaukee. Um, but this is this is exactly what we're here for is to talk about this book. And uh, we wouldn't have a bookstore without you guys um, and without you as authors. Thank you, Sangu. Uh, and I hope you have a wonderful Thank you. evening. <laughs> Thanks, you too.